Hills Church, it's great to be with you. If you've got your Bibles, go ahead and turn to Matthew chapter 11 as we continue this series, Kingdom Come. For those of you who haven't got a chance to meet, my name is Taylor Walling. Welcome to everybody who's live at one of our three campuses or if you're joining us online. And if you're watching right now and you're going, why are you sitting and why do you have a giant thing on your foot? Uh, this is not normal for us. Um, so here's, here's kind of what happened. I was playing pickup basketball and all of a sudden kind of pivoted weird, and that was that. Uh, I'm calling it Revenge of the 30s, and, uh, and our senior teaching pastor, Rick Atchley, when he heard about it, he said, I'd love to tell you that this has nothing to do with getting older, but then I would be lying. So I appreciated that encouragement from Rick. Uh, so um, any, anyway, the reason I'm, I'll actually be in this boot, unfortunately, I thought it was just going to be like a little strain or sprain. Turns out it's a midfoot fracture. So I'm going to be uh, in this thing for a couple of months, and, uh, and anyway, Anyway, so not exactly how I expected things to turn out. And interestingly enough, you could say the same thing about a man named John. And that brings us to Matthew 11. So if you have turned there, or maybe you're, you're pulling out your notes, that's where we're going to be today, Matthew chapter 11. I'm going to read verses 2 to 6 for our message today. When John who was in prison, heard about the deeds of the Messiah, he sent his disciples to ask him, are you the one who is to come or should we expect someone else? Jesus replied, go back and report to John what you hear and see. The blind receive sight, the lame walk, those who have leprosy are cleansed, the deaf hear, the dead are raised, and the good news is proclaimed to the poor. Blessed is anyone who does not stumble on account of me. We're in this series, Kingdom Come. And for all the ways that Jesus talked about why he was coming to earth and why he was bringing this kingdom of heaven or kingdom of God, before Jesus talked about the kingdom, John did. John was this forerunner, this prophet who went before Jesus and kind of was the hype man, the opening act before Jesus took center stage. And John told everybody in and around Israel and especially outside of Jerusalem, he said, God's Messiah, what that mean, that, that word, it, it means chosen one, like God's, God's redeemer, God's new king is coming, and he's going to come, according to John, with judgment and fire. That was John's message to the people. But then Jesus came, and to this point in Jesus' ministry, there's been no fire. There hasn't been much judgment. In fact, Jesus, he came in ways that John was like, what are you doing? Jesus showed up at the Jordan River where John was preaching and baptizing people. And, and John was getting people to get baptized so they could say, I've been wrong. But then Jesus comes and he wants to get baptized. And John's like, what are you, what are you doing here? You don't, you don't have anything that, that, that you've done wrong to, to repent for. Like why I shouldn't be baptizing you. And so Jesus does some things that make John go, what, what's going on? This, does, this is not what I thought would happen. And instead of cleaning house and speaking judgment or going up against the Roman authorities, instead Jesus is out in the sticks in Galilee preaching to a bunch of nobodies. Meanwhile, John, who's continued to try and speak the truth to power, particularly to a, a puppet king named Herod, who was reporting to the Romans, but he was the local king in the area, and John speaks truth to power uh, to Herod, promises this new king, says Herod's life is pretty messed up because Herod got with his uh, sister-in-law, like because of his dead brother. It's all a weird, weird thing. But through that, John ends up in prison. And he's a hundred miles away from where Jesus is. And John is going, this is not what I expected. And so he sends some of his followers to ask Jesus this question. Like, are, are are you the one? Because we've been expecting someone, but you're acting in ways that I didn't anticipate. Are you really the one? And in this moment... We have to ask this question, what what happens when the kingdom comes in ways that make us wonder if it's really the kingdom at all? 
From John's actions, I think there's a number of things we can learn in this story about the kingdom come. And the first is this. It's safe to bring our doubts to the king. John Ortberg wrote a book called Faith and Doubt. And he says that the most important word in that title is the middle one. There's too many of us who treat it as faith or doubt. When in fact, in the life of everybody who has faith in God, throughout the pages of scripture, there are tons of examples of people who wrestle with faith and doubt. Examples that range from the greatest of the prophets like Moses and Elijah to even the greatest king, David, who throughout Israel's songbook, the Psalms, has all these questions for God. And what we see again and again is that God, God allows us to ask these questions. That God doesn't say, well, if you, have, if, you have second, if you have second guesses about me or about my kingdom, then you don't belong. That's not God's message. And here, that's not Jesus' message. Back to John. So if you're listening and you're working through what you believe or you have questions, you have doubts, I want you to know you belong here. That doesn't mean that you are a lesser Christian. It doesn't mean that, that we don't have a place for you, that only the absolutely certain are here. That's just not true. Jesus invites us to come to him with our questions and with our doubts. And that's partly why even when Jesus sends the followers of John away, look at verse 7. As John's disciples were leaving, Jesus began to speak to the crowd about John. Now in the verses that follow, Here's what Jesus doesn't say. Jesus doesn't say, can you believe that guy? I thought he was a man of faith, but clearly he's not. Jesus doesn't say, I'm so disappointed in John. I thought he was a real prophet. I guess he's a false one. Jesus doesn't criticize John in the verses that follow. He actually commends him. Jesus describes John as this prophet. Jesus says, actually, he's more than a prophet. And in verse 11, Jesus goes this far. He says, truly, I tell you, among those born of women, there has not risen anyone greater than John the Baptist. It's an incredible statement. What in the world is Jesus saying right here about this guy who's been wrestling with potential doubts because things weren't working out the way he thought they would? Jesus says, John's the greatest. Of what group? Well, of those born of women kind of paints this picture of, in the context of everything else Jesus says, that in the scope of history, all of these prophets have been pointing to a time when Jesus, when God was going to come to earth, and that's Jesus. And basically, the best way we can interpret this is that J Jesus is saying, John's the greatest of those because he points to Jesus most clearly. All the other prophets, they pointed from generations down the line and said, God is coming with his kingdom. And when John did it, John literally was pointing down the street. John was pointing right at Jesus, which means he was the prophet who prophesied the most clearly because Jesus was right there. And so in the midst of his doubts, in the midst of wondering if Jesus really is the Messiah, Jesus speaks of John in the midst of his doubt and says, he's the greatest of those who've been waiting for me. But then look at what Jesus says next. Yet, whoever is least in the kingdom of heaven is greater than he. Okay, that... that kind of making me work through, okay, well, Jesus, what are you saying? Because if, if John's the greatest, if really even, even in the midst of his doubt, he, he's been this man of faith and, that, and his second guessing, his doubts don't discredit him from, from, from this, this compliment from Jesus. Why are you saying then, then anybody who's the least in the kingdom is greater than John? What's, what does this mean? Okay, so I want to help you think about this, and I want to—I uh, actually want to take advantage of the fact that I uh, that I have this this ridiculous boot on right now because since I'm going to have to have this thing on for three months, I'm not just hopping around on one foot. Now, uh, as as I'm I'm going to have somebody bring something out, uh, I don't want to make anybody jealous, but here's what I want you to see that I've been working with and will continue to work with for the next three months. It is this sweet knee scooter. This thing is awesome. I hope you got some good shots of this because basically this thing is 
has got a basket. I got my own picnic basket. This thing is, uh, you know, I can, I can pivot around and, uh, and I'm, I'm getting pretty good at it, okay? And I don't know, uh, South Lake or West Fort Worth, I may be leaving your middle screen, we'll see. But uh, as, I'm, as I'm getting to, to familiar, familiarize myself with this thing, it's pretty fun. Like, you know, first day I got this, I was like, this is cool, I got like a toy. And here's the deal, as I've gotten pretty good at this and I can scooter around on this thing, like I'm like, oh, this is fun. And at the same time, what any of us would get is that this is a temporary solution. This is serving so that here in the next three months, I'm going to be healthy and I can walk again. And for all the ways that I like this and for all the ways that I think it's pretty dope and for all the ways that I think, you know, there might be some senior saints right now watching, getting a little bit jealous. I hope not. Protect your hearts. But if you're watching and you're like, That's, that is pretty cool. I'd like that. That's fun. All of us would pick a healthy foot over having one of these. I would rather be a slowpoke on two feet than a speedster on the knee scooter because this is a temporary measure for, to reach the ideal situation. You get what I'm saying? Here's what I need you to understand. John the Baptist's ministry, he was a messianic knee scooter. He was a temporary measure to point to the kingdom coming. And so the fact that now John's looking and going, man, the, the, the kingdom doesn't, isn't exactly happening the way I thought. The kingdom isn't exactly, I'm still trying to work through all these things. Jesus is saying, John isn't disappointed because he was wrong. John is having to work through the fact that he was right. And now all of his expectations for the kingdom have to align with what God is doing on earth, which is beyond what anyone could have fully anticipated. See, John was partly right, but he wasn't fully right. And so he had to wrestle with some expectations. All right, I'm done with this, uh, with this knee scooter. You can all say goodbye to it and uh, be jealous of the fact that it's super awesome. Anyway, so here's what we have to wrestle with. We've got to wrestle with this reality when it comes to God's kingdom. The king can keep his promises without meeting our expectations. See... John, as he is watching Jesus, he's thinking, hold on. Like, there's a lot of these messianic prophecies, and John could have quoted them. He basically had the Old Testament memorized. And John the prophet could have, could have gone, hold on. There's these, these different prophecies about the, the Messiah coming, and he comes as a king who takes down all the other kingdoms. He comes as a military leader in might and in power. He comes with judgment. He comes with fire. And he would have had all those verses, all those messianic promises in his mind but then Jesus sends back an answer. And to us, when he starts listing all these things that he's been up to, we think he's just listing his kingdom to-do list, but it's more than that. Jesus is referencing an, an entire other group of promises in the Old Testament about the Messiah. I want to show you a couple of these. Look at this. Isaiah 35 might have been ringing in John's ear when he heard the answer. Then will the eyes of the blind be opened and the ears of the deaf unstopped. Then will the lame leap like a deer and the mute tongue shout for joy. Like these are some of the types of things that Jesus is describing happening. Then even he, John might have heard an allusion to Isaiah 61 verse 1. The spirit of the sovereign Lord is on me. That's the Messiah. Because the Lord has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. Like, this is, this is what the Messiah was doing. This is what Jesus, he says, look, the poor are hearing good news. And so John might be hearing all those things and thinking, yes, 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 he is doing the messianic work. But then Jesus doesn't quote what comes next. In Isaiah 61, he has sent me to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim freedom for the captives and release from darkness for the prisoners. There are many scholars who have noted and speculated that maybe this was Jesus' way of subtly saying, John, I am the one you've been waiting for, but I'm not going to do it all the way you think, and I'm not going to do it in the order you expect, and John, I'm not coming to set you free. Matthew 14 tells some of the rest of the story of how John ended up in prison. And uh, Mark chapter 6 also tells about how John eventually is killed by Herod. John doesn't make it out. 
And at the same time, we have to wrestle with, okay, so Jesus is fulfilling some of the promises of the Messiah. And he eventually will fulfill all the promises of the Messiah, but he's not doing it in the order that John wants. Sometimes he's not doing it in the order that we want. It would be like, just think about this for a second. Think about if you, if you only have part of the picture, because that's really John's issue. He had one aspect in mind, but he didn't have the whole picture. So if you, if you were told, then you'd never seen the movie Titanic. If you were told, what's the movie about? What's well, about a, a ship that sinks? Okay, that's true, but then if you go and sit down and you start watching Titanic and then you meet Jack and Rose and you see over the next couple hours this couple like fall in love and all these things and you're like, hold on, I thought this movie was about a ship that's going, that sinks, like why isn't the ship sinking? That should have been like inside the first minute, that's when we see the thing happen and you spend all that time waiting, you don't have the whole picture. Well, John has been looking at Jesus' ministry and going, hold on, where's the judgment? Why isn't it happening the way I thought? Like, wh why, why aren't you doing what I told everybody? I, w I got up and I said judgment and I said fire and here you are being nice to everybody and being merciful and you're hanging around with the wrong kind of crowd and with these social outcasts. Why aren't you doing it the way I thought you would? And I think that's why Jesus sends this word to John, but it's also for us. Blessed is anyone who does not stumble on account of me. When we evaluate God based on our expectations, that's a recipe for tripping up. Like when, when we measure and decide, is God doing what he should be doing and it's based on what we think he should be doing, th that's, that's the place where we get ourselves in a spot where we may, we may stumble and we may up, be, end up in a spiritual boot having to limp some grudges and issues and unmet expectations with God. Sometimes it happens through unmet expectations and sometimes that's compounded by difficult circumstances because John is in fact in prison. He's in a hard place. And I think that's partly why Jesus has compassion on him and sends back this loving answer with evidence of what he's been up to and says, John, I feel like this... This little last statement, blessed is anyone who doesn't stumble on account of me, is Jesus' way of saying, John, you're going to be happier in your faith if you set aside your expectations of me and take me as I am, not as you wish I was, because the kingdom comes on his terms, not ours. And the thing that we have to wrestle with is that that's not just John's problem. It's something that people have continued to struggle with when it comes to encountering Jesus as the king and experiencing part of his kingdom as he decides it is. Jesus actually goes on in this chapter to address the fact that it's not just John who has problems with unmet expectations. There's a wider group who've been looking at him thinking he should act in certain ways. Jesus brings this up in Matthew 11 verses 16 to 17. To what can I compare this generation? They're like children sitting in the marketplaces and calling out to others. We played the pipe for you and you did not dance. We sang a dirge and you did not mourn. See, Jesus compares people to kids who are playing in the street. Hey, let's, let's play wedding. Somebody, somebody needs to be the bride, okay? You be, you be the groom and we, you know, we, need, we need a preacher to, to marry these two. Who wants, who wants to play wedding? And then one of the kids says, you know, I don't, I don't want to play wedding right now. Well, fine. Let's play, let's play funeral. Who wants to be the corpse? You got to lay really, really still. And then we need somebody to do the eulogy. We need, okay, okay can, can we do that? All right, we're going to play funeral. And then the kid says, no, no thanks, not right now. Jesus basically uses this little quick picture to say, this generation is annoyed with me because I don't dance when they say dance. I don't cry when they say cry. When they say jump, I don't say how high. Jesus is not willing to do exactly what they want and to work from their playbook and to meet all their expectations. Jesus meets us where we are, but he doesn't meet all our expectations, nor does he intend to. I think it's worth noting that when Jesus sends his message back to John, he doesn't say, oh, I'm so sorry, let me adjust that. Let me, let me change up my messaging. I'll get a little bit more, uh, a little bit more heavy on judgment or I'll, I'll, I'll do a little bit more kind of just thro overthrowing the Roman. He doesn't do any of that. He says, this is who I am, and this is how I'm going to continue 
to minister. If your faith is founded on your version of Jesus, you're going to be pretty disappointed with the real Jesus. If we come to the table with the king and we have bargaining chips already that he has to live up to and he's not allowed to touch, we're not coming to the table with the real Jesus. We're creating our own version of him. Jesus is not always going to speak gently and he's not always going to come down hard. He's not going to fit in our boxes because it's his kingdom, not ours. But in those moments, if we like John are willing to bring to Jesus and say, Jesus, I don't understand. Jesus, I need, I need some help with this. Jesus, I'm wrestling with this. Jesus, I don't get why you're doing this or that. In those moments, if we're willing to bring our doubts to the king, we have a king who will meet us there. And I want you to notice what Jesus does for John. The king answers our doubts with his words and his actions. Jesus doesn't condemn Don, John. He doesn't come down on him. He, he doesn't criticize him. He sends John a real answer. And I really love, so this story is actually told in another, in another gospel. And I love the gospel of Luke's account for the way that the, the Luke orders the telling. Luke 7, look at this. When the men came to Jesus, they said, John the Baptist sent us to you to ask, are you the one who is to come or should we expect someone else? At that very time, Jesus cured many who had diseases, sicknesses, and evil spirits and gave sight to many who were blind. So he replied to the messengers, go back and report to John what you have seen and heard. <laughs> you, you, don't you love that? The fact that like they come and they come with their question. Okay, Jesus, uh, John wants to know, are you, are you really the one? And rather than answering straight away, Jesus is like, hold on, I've got some work to do. And then they watch as a blind person comes up and Jesus heals the, the blind person. They walk away being able to see. They watch as a crippled person comes up to Jesus and Jesus heals them and they walk away. They watch as someone who's demon possessed is, is all of a sudden freed from demonic oppression and walks away in their right mind. They see all these things that Jesus does in power and then Jesus looks at them and says, just go back, tell them what you saw, tell them what you heard. I love that. Jesus sends to John eyewitness accounts of God's power and God's preaching. And what I want you to understand is that for all of us who sometimes at different moments, and all of us will, wrestle with questions, wrestle with doubts, wrestle with unmet expectations of how we thought God was going to work, Jesus does the same thing. Through brothers and sisters in Christ, think about it this way, Jesus sent to John people who had just been with Jesus. Look, if you're in a place of doubt, one of the things that the enemy will try to do to you is try and get you to isolate. And yet what Jesus' solution was for John was to say, you need to hear from some people who are near me and see me at work. And so part of what I would encourage you to do if you are in the midst of wrestling with doubts and, you, and you're right now not connected to some people who follow Jesus closely, you're not connected to people you would consider mature Christians and believers, people who know and study God's word, people who, who have a, a vibrant prayer life and, are, and are, are talking to God in relationship with God, trusting God on a daily basis. It doesn't mean they're perfect. That's not what I'm talking about. But I think God wants us to get close to people who are close to Jesus in times we have questions and doubts. Because for a lot of us, it's, it's not that we need a great intellectual argument to try and win us over. Sometimes it's that we need people who are close to us to say, look, God is real in my life. Let me tell you how. Let me tell you why I believe that. That's what we need. Sometimes we need those relationships of people close to Jesus who will tell us, here's what Jesus says and here's what Jesus does. But the other thing we need is the fact that God has given, given us these accounts well-researched accounts of people. In fact, the Gospel of Luke is written by a doctor who says at the beginning of his Gospel, I went back and I talked to people who saw this happen. 
And he talked with and interviewed eyewitnesses to get a well-documented, well-researched account of what Jesus did and what Jesus said, because when we doubt and when we wrestle and we wonder, are you really God? Jesus says, listen to what I say and watch what I do. And as our senior teaching pastor referenced at the beginning of this series, Rick said, look, Jesus is the one who said, I'm going to die and I'm going to rise again. And then Jesus did it. See, there is again and again for generations an eyewitness account given by followers of Jesus who saw what Jesus did and heard what Jesus said and they wouldn't shut up about it. And what that began to create was this this feverish spreading of faith, not doubt. The more they talked about what they had seen Jesus do and say, the more people were drawn in to go, you know what? God may not meet my expectations, but it seems like in Jesus, he's meeting my needs and he's meeting deeper hopes than I ever thought I had. Because Jesus came for all of us who are brokenhearted, for all of us who are sick, for all of us who are imprisoned. And for us, it's not only the physical realm in which we're struggling, it's the fact that in sin, we are sick and we are broken and we are crippled and we are downcast and we are in bondage. And Jesus is the one who came to set us free. We can't expect anyone else who's gonna come on our behalf. It is Jesus Christ and him alone who came. And guess what? One of the reasons he didn't immediately speak judgment is because Jesus' plan was to take our judgment. He would be the one in his own language to be baptized with fire. And in that, Jesus makes this reference to the moment when he would go to a cross and pay for our sins for all the things we needed to repent of, for all the ways that we had gone against Jesus, for all the ways we had tried to be our own kings, the kingdom came with a Jesus who didn't throw judgment on us first, but took it on himself and then invites us to accept that forgiveness and grace. And he meets us in our bondage to sin and through his saving grace, through his work on the cross, through his resurrection from the grave, Jesus sets us free. Jesus makes it so we can stand up and walk, not in our own power, but in the Holy Spirit's power in us. We're going to talk about that more next week in this series. It is Jesus who's come and he says, look, you need to meet me where I am for what I've said and what I've done. So to paraphrase pastor and author John Mark Comer, the goal of life in the kingdom is not a life free of doubt but a life full of trust. So when I look at what Jesus has done, I can trust. When I hear what Jesus has said, I can trust. When I remember that he's died on the cross for my sins, I can trust. When I remember that he rose from the grave, I can trust. When I remember that now he has won adoption into God's family, that he has made me a citizen of God's kingdom, then I can trust him with my doubts and my questions, but I can also trust him walking forward, looking for his expectations, his will to be done, his kingdom to come, and to know that even if it's not what I expected, it is gonna be far better than I could ever do on my own. Let's pray together. Jesus, I thank you for your mercy and grace. Thank you for being merciful and gracious to us in our doubts and in our questions and in the times we wonder, is this, is this real? Are you really God? Thank you for meeting us there and answering us with what you've said and what you've done. Would you well in us and grow in us trust in who you are and trust that you know more than we do and help us to entrust all of our lives to what you want for your kingdom and to submit our expectations to you. Lead us and guide us, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.